Starting in October, China suddenly increased military activities near the Taiwan Strait. From October 1st to the 4th, a total of 149 PLA aircraft entered Taiwan's southwest airspace. However, on October 9th, the day before Taiwan's National Day, Xi Jinping in a speech mentioned peaceful reunification with Taiwan. After that, activities by Chinese military planes waned. Even Russian President Putin echoed the Chinese leader in saying that China doesn't need to use force to achieve reunification. So has the threat of war in the Taiwan Strait cooled down? Or is it just the moment of silence before a bigger storm? Hi everyone, welcome to Lei's Real Talk, I'm Lei. People have been speculating about a war in the Taiwan Strait when China uses military force to take over the island. But no one can say whether a war will break out. To gain more insight into the matter, we will look at several factors weighing on the Chinese Communist Party's decision. First of all, let's answer a big question. After the return of Hong Kong and Macau to China in 1997 and 1999, respectively, the island of Taiwan stood out like a thorn for the regime. The CCP passed the anti-secession law in 2005 to provide the legal basis for taking Taiwan by force. The law, of course, was condemned by Taiwan. The CCP has threatened Taiwan with military attacks to intimidate the Taiwanese during their 2016 presidential election. Shortly before the election, a retired lieutenant general of the Chinese army wrote an article titled, The Timing is Ripe for Liberating Taiwan. After the pro-Taiwan candidate Tsai Ing-wen won the election, a pro-CCP Chinese scholar called on Xi Jinping to launch a war against Taiwan, claiming that peaceful reunification with Taiwan is impossible now. A few months later, in November and December of 2016, Mainland China's warplanes circled around Taiwan twice in two weeks. But the real escalation of tension in the Taiwan Strait was after the CCP's 19th National Congress in the fall of 2017. The most important decision the CCP made at this Congress was to eliminate the term limit for the party's top leader. Mao Zedong was the first CCP leader and held the job for life. Deng Xiaoping, who followed Mao, changed it to a limit of two terms. Each term is five years. So the next two leaders, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, each held the position for roughly 10 years. Xi Jinping, however, changed it back to a lifetime job. The outside world couldn't figure out why or how he did it. Hong Kong-based political commentator Alexander Liao, in a recent YouTube video, talked about a conversation he had with a CCP official back in 2018 in Hong Kong. The official asked Liao to guess the rationale she used to convince CCP leaders to eliminate the term limit. According to Liao, Taiwan reunification is what got Xi his lifetime chairmanship. So in April 2018, months after the 19th National Congress, China's Ministry of Defense officially announced that the People's Liberation Army would conduct patrol training around the island but this training was the actual military combat exercise. In January 2019, Xi Jinping called for China's reunification and said he would not rule out reunification by force. In one of his most recent speeches at the Great Hall on October the 9th, she said, the historical mission of our country's unification must be and will be achieved. But unlike his previous speeches, he struck a softer tone by mentioning a peaceful reunification with Taiwan. As early as in the 1980s, CCP leader Deng Xiaoping came up with the one country, two systems model for Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Macau. But after seeing what happened in Hong Kong, 88% of Taiwan's people rejected one country, two systems, according to a Taiwanese survey this past September. The only way the CCP can accomplish unification without resorting to military attacks is by taking the island from within through espionage and infiltration. Taiwanese writer Zheng Wencheng described in detail how the CCP had penetrated Taiwan in his book, Full Penetration, China is Controlling Taiwan. It has been going on for decades, 
and Beijing has shifted from targeting political and business elites in the early days to targeting all social strata and every Taiwanese citizen. According to Zheng, whether it's young people, professionals, farmers, fishermen, or the Aboriginal people who live in remote areas, the CCP has developed an infiltration model for each one of them through local agents in Taiwan. More than one million Taiwanese do business in China and frequently travel between the island and the mainland. They are often the targets of espionage activities. In addition, more than 300,000 mainland Chinese are married to Taiwanese and live in Taiwan. Lu Yuexiang, the head of their organization, is openly pro-CCP and vowed to help Beijing do what's inconvenient to do and say what's inconvenient to say. Media and the internet in Taiwan are also filled with programs from the mainland, spreading the CCP's worldview and made in China fake messages. Zheng said that without firing a bullet, through its pervasive networks and communication systems, the CCP is going all out to enter the island, enter the homes, and enter the brains of people. Recently, China released a Korean War movie called Battle at Lake Changjing. It's a massive propaganda film that even young children in elementary schools are organized to see for patriotic education. This film is to prepare the Chinese public for wars, especially a war with the United States. If a war is prolonged and the number of casualties high, it will have a huge impact on Chinese society that's unprecedented. The Nikkei Asian Review had a comment in September on the fact that the Chinese Communist military comprises soldiers who are the single child in a family. Chinese political analyst Heng He estimated that up to 80% of the CCP's military are currently single children. For Chinese families, passing on the family lineage is very important. Losing the only child in a family is going to be very, very difficult to accept. But if it happens on a large scale, the impact is enough to make the CCP worry. After all, human society has not seen an army composed mainly of only children. It's evident that the CCP's decades of enforcing the only child policy is taking its toll on the society in many ways. So, when will the CCP plan a military attack, if it attacks? According to an October 16th Voice of America report, Taiwan's Defense Minister Chiu Guozhen said that the CCP already has the capability to attack Taiwan, but it has to consider the costs and impact of waging war right now. He said that the cost of war can be further reduced for Beijing if delayed until 2025. Zheng Jiwen, editor-in-chief of Taiwan's Asia-Pacific Defense magazine, said that this is the first time Taiwan's defense ministry has specified a point in time for war. To me, this implies that the war is more eminent than in the past. In a speech at the Naval Academy last week, U.S. Secretary of the Navy Carlos del Toro pointed out that For the first time since the defeat of the Soviet Union, we have a strategic competitor with naval capabilities and capacities that rival and in some areas even surpass our own. Del Toro is not the only senior U.S. military official to make such an assessment. U.S. Air Force Deputy Chief of Staff Clinton Hynode said on September 20th, in key areas of the competition between China and the United States, in a few important areas, we are behind. This is not a tomorrow problem. This is a today. So that's the world we're in. I'll leave it to everyone to draw your own conclusions. So much for today. You can watch the videos on PLA corruption and espionage and the Chinese population. Thank you. I'll see you next time.